From the Youth Science Council, this is Good Question, a podcast about science in the UAE. I'm your host, Sara Shirbiji. Today we are joined by Hind Al Amri. Hind is an assistant scientist for marine species at the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi. She is also a biological sciences PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, researching the turtles of Abu Dhabi. In this episode, we talk about turtles mainly, conservation techniques, endangerment and wildlife trading, amongst other things. Here is our conversation. Hello, Hind. Welcome to the show. Hello. It's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is the much-awaited conversation about turtles. <laughs> um, all right, so I know you work for the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi, and that this is the Middle East's largest environmental le- regulator committed to marine ecosystem and biodiversity preservation. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about its history and what brought on this need Um, to develop this uh, particular form of institution? Yeah, so the Environment Agency uh, started with a group of ecologists. They were, it, was very, it was a very small group, and it started back in 1996. And it was all because of uh, the late Sheikh Zayed. Uh, he saw the need to protect the environment that we are in. And it started with him just being um, very cautious about all the species that we have, as well as he was very concerned about the environment, starting with the mangroves, for example. Um, so, yeah, it was basically his vision that brought us all together now. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's been an increasing need to utilize these former institutions. Um, like, I imagine much more than 1996. Of course. Yeah. Um, and did it start like as a terrestrial, uh, mainly focused on terrestrial species, which obviously, because you know, it gives us the instinct that this is, these are animals that are included, and yes. but also it's plants, as you mentioned, so yes. plants as well. Um, okay, so uh, I also read that Um, it's got this, uh, you know, policies that it issues yeah. uh, to protect certain species. Uh, and it forms a network of protected areas, like yeah. the Sadiat Marine National Park, which houses the critically endangered hawksbill sea turtle. Can you yes. tell me a little bit about this hawksbill uh, sea turtle? So the hawksbill sea turtle is one of the seven species found worldwide uh, of marine turtles. But within Abu Dhabi waters, we only have the hawksbill as well as the green. But the hawksbills are the only ones that nest in Abu Dhabi. Um, they are um, critically endangered as per the IUCN Red List, and they've been threatened due to a lot of issues, mainly because of their carapace, which is basically their back, is very pretty. So people used to hunt them to trade that and give them as gifts to people. Like I said, they nest here in Abu Dhabi, and we've been seeing an average of about 152 nests. Okay, so they nest Abu Dhabi, so that, that doesn't mean that it's not it's necessarily their home base or their main habitat. Do they just go there to nest and then move elsewhere, or do they remain there? So um, the thing about turtles in general, they have this thing that's called site fidelity, which is basically they come back to places which is familiar to them. Oh. And specifically with turtles, uh, the fun fact about them is that Whichever nests they actually hatched from when they were babies is the same nest or the same location that they would come back to to, to lay their eggs. So they have this magnetic thing in their in their system which actually draws them back to the same beach where they came out from to actually lay their eggs again. Do they usually move around quite far from this place in their lifetime or do they remain around this area, which kind of explains why they would return to it? Or do yeah. they move quite far and then return back to their main area? Yeah, so in general, uh, turtles in general are known to conduct vast migrations that's over thousands of kilometers. But what we've seen from research that's been done here in Abu Dhabi is when we tagged these turtles after they nested, Um, they actually stay within the area, which is a bit different to what we've been seeing worldwide. Um, it could be due to them, because of the extreme weather we have here, it could be because they can't really move those distances, and because um, probably they just like to be close to home. Mm, so yeah. yeah, Have they been here for a very long time? Are they um, sort of native to the area? Yes, they are. The hawksbill turtles are native to the area. They've been here for for as long as people have been researching them. And turtles around the world have been around for more than 200 million years, as scientists have said. Mm, right, okay. So tell me about you then. How did you narrow down to turtles? So it started off in a different direction for me when I was doing my bachelor's. Uh, when I went to Abu Dhabi University, I started out as a landscape architect student. But then, unfortunately, the university has 
told us that that major is going to be closed down due to reasons for themselves and that we had to change our majors. And they told us the closest thing is Lance is sorry, architecture, but it's not what I, where I saw myself. So it was just basically me going around trying to find something that would somehow not make me lose the two years that I've already been into the university. Um, and environmental science was that. Uh, and looking back, I'm happy that I actually took that choice because environmental science opened up a lot of areas for me when it comes to conservation and the, saving the environment, basically. Uh, after that, um, because as you know, a lot of bachelor degrees require an internship factor. And I was lucky enough to be intern interning at the Environment Agency, where I took uh, a whole tour of the whole agency for about six weeks. And I, st I was being trained by different sectors. And then I just fell in love with the terrestrial and my marine biodiversity sector. And when it came to interviewing me for the job, it's where I wanted to be, specifically in marine. And then again, um, looking like with my manager, uh, because we look at threatened species as well as habitats, I just narrowed it down to marine turtles. It, ju it just fell into my lap, as you would say. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it just okay. did. Um, okay, so uh, these turtles then, we know of turtles, tortoises, and terrapins. What's the difference between them? I know that the order, if I'm pronouncing correctly, is testudines. Yes. So if you give us an idea on the differences between these subspecies. So uh, the main difference is where they are. Uh, so they're either marine, freshwater, or land turtles. And that's what people sometimes can get mixed up with. They believe that all turtles are the same but they are very different species and they have different biology. Mm -hmm. And freshwater meaning? Meaning they can be river turtles. Oh, river turtles. Yeah. Oh, we don't have any freshwater turtles in this We area. We have a few, but that falls into the terrestrial biodiversity more than, than marine, because marine is basically just the sea and oceans. Oh, right, okay. So um, I, I, I don't have much info about. Yeah, but they're not like exclusive categories. They they move in between, right? So you don't have exclusive, like turtles are not exclusively sea. They can also walk on land. Or tortoises are not exclusively land, but they can also swim. Is that true? Um, well, sea turtles, um, they, they use both. But yeah. majority of the time is spent in the sea, but they only come to land to nest or they're sick or they're, they can't swim anymore and we find them washed up. That's the only reason they would come back, come to shore. Mm. But like I said, the majority of their life is sea, so yeah. that's why they're sea turtles. Do they nest exclusively on the shore? Yes, on the beach. Yeah, they don't they, nest they, underwater. No, they don't. They need the beach. They need the beach to, to uh, dig up, lay their eggs, and then cover it up. Wait, wait, what's, what's so special about the sand? Um, it's just the way it is. And then because the, the eggs themselves depend on the sun temperature to develop. Okay. So, um, that's part of their, their system. Okay. Um, so, uh, this kind of segues into my, uh, fact about turtles. I just want to ask, just kinda, I'll, I'll throw them at you and then you just give me any comments that you have about okay. them. And I think the first one is related to what you were just talking about. Yes. Uh, so I read that turtles don't necessarily have maternal instincts. So it's not like they stay with their eggs. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Yes. So, so they just leave them. Yes. Uh, turtles and marine turtles are solitary animals. They like to be independent. Uh, and that maternal factor is not there. So once the female turtle would nest on the beach, she would cover it up, camouflage it, so people people and other predators can't find it. She would go back to sea and that's it. She doesn't come back. She doesn't stay with her eggs. Uh, she doesn't look for them later. So it's just, it's them on their own. Is this common in the animal kingdom? Because I feel like, you know, you read about how uh, species evolve to protect their kin because yeah. their progeny are a very strong component of their own survival, their own genetic survival. Yes. Is this very common in the animal kingdom? Because it seems like it's very peculiar for a species to just leave their kids to fend off for themselves. Or do you see this amongst other kinds no, of species? No, I think, I think you find... Both, like if you talk about marine mammals, for example, you'd, you'd see the dolphins, for example, staying with their babies for two to three years until they're independent. And even after that, they would all remain within the pod. But sea turtles, you won't see that. Uh, even when they're swimming, unless they're mating, they won't, they won't be with the group. Yeah, so that means they're independent. So you see these individual turtles yeah. on their own. They don't go out in groups. No, for example, they, don't. they don't hunt for food in groups. No, they don't no. move around. Uh, they so, migrate some, on their own? Sometimes you see them 
if you if you see a group that's next to each other, that's probably because the food is available there, but not because they're like family or they're <laughs> like together and swimming together. So no, they're solitary animals. Um, okay, so if I am correct, then um, because I'm thinking, I mean, okay, the reason why animals stick together is because it gives them a good chance to fend off predators, right? Yeah. You know, this kind of cooperation exists between in, within groups to fend off other types of um, um, uh, sort of predators that yes. uh, that could possibly uh, prey on them. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that decrease the chances of individual turtles of surviving because they're so independent? So marine turtles, when it comes to their survival, it has been published before that only 1% actually make it to adulthood. Well, that makes sense. That, that makes, makes sense. sense. Yes. And it's, um, it's because of this. It's because um, if you think of it, uh, so a single nest would have an average, at, I'm talking about Abu Dhabi only, would have about 120 eggs. So if 120 eggs, all of them hatched and all of them survived, our sea would be full of turtles and you won't see anything else. So that's just the way nature is. That's nature's selection. Yeah. So yeah. if uh, even if 1% only makes it to adulthood, that's yeah. fine yeah. because that's more than enough. How many eggs are usually hatched by single um, I would say around 80%. 80%? Yeah. So I eight. mean, like, how many eggs usually are hatched? Uh, uh, so oh, so, 80%. so I mean, like, how many, how many are, are laid by so a single uh, uh, So per season, we've seen um, about... Um, so it depends, again, on the species. Yeah. But uh, some of them do come back twice or three times every season to lay eggs. Yeah. And how many eggs are they usually? Like 10? So the one? first... No, the first nest would be on average 100 to 120 eggs what? yeah okay. that's that's what that's my fact about the one percent yeah because if the whole 120 made it to adulthood the whole <laughs> you'd just be seeing seas wow. of uh, turtles wow. yeah that's amazing yeah all right so next one um so there are the, oh, you mentioned this so they're uh some of the most ancient reptiles alive yes so they're, they're, they're ancient they're really old okay and their backs are actually made of bone and they can't survive without them. So we think that they can crawl out of their shells. You know, if, if we've seen cartoons before, it's like <laughs> yes, they, the, turtles tend to kind of just crawl out of their shells. But that's not yeah, true, is it? No, that's not true. It's, it's, for sea turtles, it's not true. They cannot even retract their uh, their neck and flippers. They can't, like, pull them inside yeah, into yeah. their shell, like yeah. a protective thing like we've seen yeah, in the like cartoons. Yeah, like when it gets really scared. No, kinda, you they, know. Can't, they can't do that. It's, pa it's part of their bone structure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, um, oh, so... We don't really know how old they are because they only started caring about this question in the last century. So we don't know how old they can become. Can they grow older than 100 years or uh, more? Because, uh, you know, maybe like this kind of uh, specialty hasn't been um, really cultivated or developed prior to, say, the 1900s. Yeah. Is that true? Well, they, they are species that can grow old. Some have said to 100 plus years uh definite number is not I, i'm not really sure but yeah. yeah they they are species that can grow really yeah. old. Yeah. yeah we'd have to have been studying them for a, over 100 years yes. for us to know, to know whether they can grow older exactly. than 100 years and we'd have to be tracking them individually yeah. like this is that turtle and That's, it's grown over 100 yeah. years and um well we'll know i guess this this, uh, this question can be answered in a few uh decades hopefully um okay you can tell the sexes apart Yes. Well, it depends on how old they are. Yeah. Um, so sea turtles, when they're when they just hatched, you can't tell. There's no physical thing that would tell you the difference if it's a male or a female. Yeah. And the only way you can do that is by actually uh, looking inside the turtle when they're that young. Yeah. But yes, when they do grow old, is it visible? It's you can tell, especially by the size. Again, it depends on the species. Yeah. But it's basically the size of the, their tail. Their tail? Yeah. So what about their tail? Bigger so if, for males? Yes. Okay. Basically. Wow. Okay. But then you'd have to know the variety of sizes of tails for yeah, you to be and, able to recognize yeah. it. Oh, this is a, you know, you know, pretty large tail for yes. a turtle. Yeah. And you have to be like well-trained, like your eye has to be well-trained to tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I personally can't, but yeah. Okay. Going back to the turtle conservation. So you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, there, the, these, uh, eggs that are laid don't have a very high chance of, um, surviving. So yes. then one means of conserving these, um, eggs, um, is through head starting. Yeah. Uh, so it's a conservation technique in which endangered species are raised artificially. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about that and other techniques maybe if this is not preferred? 
So head starting hasn't been a popular method of conservation. Um, I'm not really sure on the details of why, but the other ways that we can do that is basically by If we know that these eggs are exposed to threats, for example, predators, we can either fence them off or we could actually translocate these um, these eggs to safer locations. So that's a method that we are actually doing, not because of the temperature, but uh, sorry, not because of the predator, but because we know on that beach there's going to be a lot of flooding thus affecting the eggs. So we are moving them to higher locations for them to have a better chance at survival. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what other conservation techniques do you usually use besides this one? Uh, it's because here in Abu Dhabi, we don't have much issue with predators. Yeah, so yeah. The, the only thing that we are facing is the uh, flooding events. Sure. Okay, I understand. Uh, and do you take them away to, to other open locations or do you put them, for example, in, you know, incubators? Uh, no, they are in natural beaches, okay. but on higher locations. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, so what factors are overplayed and what factors are underplayed in terms of uh, turtle conservation? Uh, so, for example, um, I don't know, I read somewhere that um, uh, straws, plastic straws, that factor is severely overplayed by media in terms of its effect on uh, sea turtles and that there are other forms of, um, well, other factors that threaten uh, sea turtles that yes. are not exclusive to plastics, okay. uh, such as habitat destruction. Can yes. you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, habitat destruction is considered to be one of the main threats uh, after trade, which was which used to happen before. Um, that's because, like I said, um, both habitat as well as nesting beach destruction, a lot of developments now are happening along coastlines. So that affects the locations where a turtle that's used to come to this nesting beach to lay her eggs, she won't find that beach anymore. So she would either, I'm not sure, move to another location or deal with it in another way, but that's one of the main threats. And then habitat destruction itself within the, the seas, such as corals, such as seagrass habitats, that all affect the availability of nutrition for these sea turtles, thus affecting their health, thus them not having the ability to swim, being weak, and then dying in the end. So, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, habitat destruction is one of the main threats. Mm -hmm. And uh, besides the um, the hawksbill sea turtle, there are other types of endangered species within this turtle family. Yeah. Um, so, for example, I know about the leatherback turtles, are the yeah. largest of all turtles. Yes. And apparently the fourth heaviest reptile behind three crocodiles. Yes. Um, and you mentioned the IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And it's got this red list um, of threatened species. It's yes. got these different categories, right? Yes. So, Uh, maybe, you know, you could expand on this better than me, but so you go from extinct to extinct in the wild to critically endangered to endangered. Can you tell us a little bit the, about the difference between critically endangered and endangered, especially with respect to turtles like the hawksbill turtle? Okay, so the red list criteria for a species to be listed in that, it has to go through extensive literature, it has to go through extensive surveys, a lot of experts that are actually working with these species have to contribute to, and they have this, this criteria where you're like tick off boxes, I'd say, and then in the end you would fall under, it would fall under a specific criteria. Um, when it comes to the difference between endangered and critically endangered, that's basically depending on the species and location, because it can mean that either the, the number of species found within a specific square kilometer is less than what they would like for it to be there, thus at being critically endangered rather than endangered. So all of these categories are based on a list of criteria that the IUCN has previously identified. And it, like I said, it goes through, like we've, we've done this specifically for Abu Dhabi as well as the Emirates for the species that are here. And we've seen that Sometimes, because of the location and the number that we have, it can differ from the actual and the official IUCN red list. Right. And it, should we be hopeful um, of rescuing some of the species that are in this critically endangered category? Do we have a history of rescued species from that category? Well, we have one that um, the Environment Agency has worked on where it, was, it wasn't actually a marine species. It was a terrestrial one. Um, it was one of the oryxes where it was extinct in the wild, 
And because of the private collection of His Highness um, Sheikh Zayed, they were able to breed it and then reintroduce it into the wild where it removed it from that category to just, um, I think it was critically endangered now. I'm not really sure, but it did move the, the criteria from a lesser extreme. Okay, great. That's wonderful. It's good to hear. Um, and then you also mentioned wildlife trading. Yes. So what's this wildlife trading? Sounds so wildlife, pretty depressing. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, wildlife trading is basically, as the name says, it's trading wildlife, where people usually used to, when it comes to turtles, usually used to hunt them for their meat, as well as collect their eggs. Uh, they used to trade... Wait, people eat turtles? Yes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, in the past... It's quite a rare delicacy. <laughs> so they, they do. And some countries, like... They've had it as a like a cultural thing where they believe that it has some like healing factors to it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Stuff like that. Speci- specifically with the eggs as well. They used to they used to do that, and this, they also used to uh, remove their backs, the carapace, and they used to make jewelry out of them. It used to be given as an ornament for like I've been to this country. This is a gift, a souvenir uh, kind of thing. So. They used to trade it not just as an animal itself and as, as a for meat, but actually every part of the of the turtle. Mm, so going back to endangerment, yeah, um, I read somewhere in that um, the uh, the endangerment of turtles. Uh, so interestingly, it's it, there's a recreational activities in the sea. Uh, tend to kind of harm the turtles. And this is one of the causes. It's not necessarily just the hunting or the being caught in nets and so yes. on, but it's recreational boats. Yes. Uh, is this common here? or uh, you Unfortunately, know, yes. We've been getting, because we do look into mortality of uh, marine species in general, and a lot of the turtles that we get washed up ashore do have signs of vessel strike, which is basically boats hitting them. Because if either they were speeding, maybe the the propeller of the boat uh, hits their fins, making uh, sorry their flippers, making yeah, them unable yeah. to swim, thus yeah. dying. Yeah, we've we've been seeing some of those as well. Okay, so that uh, drives me to our uh, next and final question. Okay, um, what can we do to contribute to the conservation of turtles and other marine species? So, for example, people who are on recreational boats, how can they avoid such a scenario in which they're killing turtles? I think the main thing that people can do is to first educate themselves when it comes to speed limits, for example, because we do, specifically with protected areas, we do have, uh, although some protected areas have limits to what kind of activities that can be conducted, um, people to be more aware of what kind of species are available in that region, um, to also make sure that they educate the people, like, for example, transfer that knowledge to the younger generation as well. Um, I know you mentioned plastics is overused, but we are really concentrating. No, I don't want to be, I don't want to be held uh, responsible no, for that. No. I was just <laughs> testing that piece of information. No, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> Go but, plastic free. <laughs> but it mean, but with specifically with marine turtles, for example, if uh, you think of plastic bags being in the, in the ocean, they can actually mistake them for jellyfish and eat them. So, for example, one of the turtles we've dissected that was washed up ashore, we've actually found pieces of plastic within their digestive tract. So it is an important thing that people stop using plastic in general, not just recycling them. Oh, that's true. That's certainly true. Right, before we go, can you just tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the University of Exeter and in Abu Dhabi with these sea turtles? So my PhD is in biological sciences, and I'm looking at the marine turtles in Abu Dhabi, specifically the hawksbill turtle, because I'm looking at how climate change would probably affect hawksbill nesting, because they do depend a lot on temperature to develop in their eggs, and because we're in a such extreme environment where heat can go up to 45 degrees during the summer, which is when they nest, I want to see if they are actually adapting or if temperature is really affecting them. And from that, we could predict future temperatures where to see if these hawksbills would be able to adapt or not. Can you give me an example on how they are adapting? So what we're seeing right now is that they are coming to nest earlier during the season okay. rather than midsummer like before. Their incubation duration, which is the period from when they nest to when they hatch, is much shorter 
which means that they are actually developing much faster to hatch. So those are kind of the signs that are showing us that there's some sort of adaptation, but I wouldn't know until I look further into it. During are they life. breaking away from some, you know, uh, common conceptions of how uh, uh, eggs hatch under such temperatures? Yes. So because a lot of these research that has been published before are yeah. in colder yeah. ro- locations, they have been said they've they've said that the thermal limit for turtles to develop is 33 or 35 degrees. Okay. But we're not, we're seeing much higher temperatures. So there has to be something different here, yeah. which is what I'm looking into. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. Cool. Right. Uh, anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I think we've covered everything. All right. About awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, then this looks like it's a wrap for us. Thank you, Hin, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. That was Hind Ad Amri, assistant scientist for marine species at the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi and biological sciences PhD candidate at the University of Exeter. To listen to more episodes, you can find Good Question on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for what you'd like to see from us next, you can reach us at Good Question UAE on Instagram and Twitter, or email us at info at goodquestion.ae. Good Question is a production of the Youth Science Council and the Office of Advanced Sciences in the United Arab Emirates. Produced and directed by Hindal Ali and Hayat Al-Hassan. Sara Al-Ali is our editor. Our social media and communications are managed by Mohammed Al-Mansouri and Fatma Lutah. And I'm Sara Shirbaji. 